problems and so on. So I will try to a little bit repeat some of the stuff which you already hear from Manuel as well as from Yuli Nazarov. And let's see how far we go and how much we will learn. Okay. Uh, so because of my lovely accent, okay, this was working before, the funny thing. Interestingly enough, it doesn't now. That's weird. Ah, yeah, okay, good. Because of my lovely accent, recently I was asked if Würzburg is close to the Novosibirsk. <laughs> so I actually decided to show you where is Würzburg because anyway, it's very difficult to pronounce it. So as you can see, Würzburg is actually in Germany between Frankfurt and Nuremberg. For those who do not know it, actually, I got this question in Trieste, so that wasn't in America, you know, just to be sure, yeah? So it's actually a very lovely university. So as you can see, we have a long traditions. Uh, I don't know, this is looking like Baroque building uh, of doing physics. We actually have um, a good few Nobel Prize laureate, including Röntgen. Um, hmm? <laughs> no, Bosnia is not so bad, but still, I mean, it's a different location <laughs> geographically. <laughs> I said I will be politically incorrect already, <laughs> or, and this is actually my group. So let me show it at the at the beginning. So this is Fernando, Benny, Alex, Christian, Jan, Dimi, and Niklas. And as you can see, we actually look, I am actually, we have lots of money and I am looking for PhD <laughs> students and postdoc. We are still alive and very happy. So hopefully, if you like my talk, or if you like the, uh, the themes which I am working on, please let me know. Maybe you can chat with me today on the poster with the beer or wine, whatever, and just uh, come by to me, okay? Uh, okay, so let's, uh, let me show now outline. So uh, I will show a little bit of the intro to topological insulators. You already saw it, but I mean, I feel that uh, maybe some repetition always helps. Then I give you a short intro to superconductivity. So I am really going now from one book to another. Yeah? And then actually I focus on uh, this part where I will wanted to show you is that actually if I put S-wave superconductor on the top of uh, topological insulator, I can actually induce non-unconventional P-wave superconductivity. Yeah? So that's what I'm going to try to show you, some of the things. We possibly don't know yet what is P-wave superconductivity, some of you, but I will try to draw some pictures and explain this a little bit, how does it come out. And let's see if we actually manage to go to these last two points, which are related to the thermal conductance through this kind of Josephson junctions, as well as uh, systems with the uh, Rajba spin orbit interactions. But if we're not going to get there, then we're not going to get there. Okay, so that's what you heard already. So we are very happy that we have a new state of matter, which is topological insulator. So obviously it's very different from metal, where I actually feel all states still the Fermi energy. It's very different from the insulator when I have a bulk. So I need an excitation energy to actually go here to here. So with the topological insulator, it's like a hybrid, yeah? So I'm actually driving Toyota Prius hybrid, so I know exactly how this works, yeah? So it's like a half, it's metal and insulator, yeah? So actually in a bulk, it behaves like an insulator, but at the edge, it has actually metallic states, yeah? And that's, these metallic states are, can be used, for example, for the spintronics purposes for manipulation of the spin. So we could actually think about it like a highways where we have a well-defined spin of electrons where we can transfer energy almost without dissipation. It's never dissipationless even if we save us, okay? So anyway, so that's exactly what Manuel was talking about. So how do I get this in the semiconducting? So this topological insulator, which we are saying are so fantastic and so on, they are really semiconductors. They're actually narrow gap semiconductors which were known for a long, long time to exist or to be produced by MBE techniques. However, what we didn't know is that they have this topological property. Yeah? So let's look first on gallium arsenide. So I, I guess that every of you heard about gallium arsenide. So I have actually energy and here I have some bands. 
So this is a semiconductor. I have a conduction band, which is more or less built from S-like uh, orbitals. And I have a valence band, which is built from P-like orbitals. Usually I have here a heavy hole and light hole because this is depending on the total uh, momentum, which is in my system. So angular plus spin, but that's not so important. And this is a usual band structure of a semiconductor. So the conduction band is S-like and the valence band is P-type. Okay, so what is, and this is normal band ordering in the semiconductor, as we say. So what is actually typical material which could be related to the um, topological insulator is mercury terrorite. So that's also not very healthy material. But what happens is that now you have what is called inversion of the band. So what happens in this material is that you have strong relativistic corrections, which I don't want to come into here, or, and, strong spin-orbit interaction, which makes inversion of this band. So what happens is, is that your conduction band, now it's built from P-like orbitals, and your valence band is actually built from S-like orbitals. So it's actually different than in the usual case. Okay, so now, what one can grow, for example, in Würzburg very nicely, is this kind of mercury telluride, cadmium telluride structures, okay? So what happens is that you have mercury telluride in the middle, and then, so this is a quantum well, and this is actually in the barrier, you have a cadmium telluride, okay? And interestingly enough is that uh, depending now, what is the, so the mercury telluride has an inverted band structure, so we said that this, Conduction band is from the p orbitals and the valence band is from the s orbitals. And now depending how, what is the width of this mercury terror right here, I actually can go from the situation when I have a topological insulator, we come back to this in a second, to the situation when I have a normal insulator, okay? So cadmium telluride here has a normal band structure, I just wanted to emphasize. Okay, so what you saw during so this inversion of the bands, so this kind of having the p orbitals in the conduction band in uh, relation to the, uh, to the s orbitals in the valence band is actually in the heart of this kind of topological insulators. So now you have to think about it as a full system, okay? So this is my full system. If now the uh, mercury terrorite is actually this layer in the structure which I showed just a second ago, it's right. Yeah, it's thin enough. Then the, my band structure is inverted. So the um, heavy hole band is actually above of the electron like band. And then here, let's say I have vacuum. So remember what was drawing nicely. Um, nicely manual, he was drawing this interface when he actually had here something which is trivial, which was having trivial invariant, and here he was drawing something which has non-trivial invariant, yeah? And then at the edge, there can be, or because of the bulk boundary correspondence, which he discussed, at the edge, there can be this kind of edge states, and that's exactly what happens. You can think about it even more naively. So this is my mercury telluride quantum well with inverted band structure, and this is vacuum on left and right. But then I wanted to connect the band structure of my mercury telluride, let's say, with a uh, vacuum. Uh, but the band structure is inverted outside. So I, if I wanted to connect them, then you can see that I immediately have this leads to the formation of the metallic edge states at the boundary. And this is a very simple, I would say experimental picture in which you immediately see that from the, if you take two semiconductors or semiconductor with the inverted band structure and you put it in respect to the vacuum, you need to have some kind of edge states flowing. Now the question is, are they trivial? Are they non-trivial? Actually, these states were already found in the 1980s by Pankratov. And they actually found it within some kind of band structure calculations. But, but they didn't know that they are topological. So this is exactly why we never, nobody was interested in somebody for the oil, maybe there are some kind of spurious states, yeah? And exactly these states here now, they are actually counter-propagating states as we draw, and they have a different spin polarization, okay? So these are, these are exactly these metallic states which we would like to talk about, yeah? So once again, topological insulator have a bulk gap while at the edge, one has this kind of one-dimensional metallic states. 
Okay, so how can I think about it? So I like to think about it, the many of you I guess heard about quantum Hall effect and again Manuel was talking about quantum Hall effect. So let's say I have perpendicular magnetic field and I am having actually the chiral edge sets which is going around, yeah, because of the, uh, because of uh, if I apply, let's say, a current, I have always a magnetic field, then I will actually have the cyclotron orbits which are skipping at the edge of my sample and I will get this edge set here for a given spin direction. Okay, now let's put another one, which is actually a magnetic field with, which is opposite. Then what happens is I should get edge state which goes in the opposite direction. Now let's do the following trick. Let's put them together. Now you should complain. You should say, hey, if I have no magnetic field, magnetic field is zero. Why? This is still here traveling around. Okay. Well, and why I can now remove this degeneracy between spin up and spin down? Yeah? How do I remove the degeneracy between spin up and spin down? What kind of interactions do I need, for example? Exactly, but if I have a spin orbit interaction in a system, then obviously I can have these two counter propagating edge sets with opposite spin, and they can be over there, and everything works. Yeah? So that's exactly what we have over here. So we do not break time reversal symmetry. Yeah? So we exactly talked about Kramer's partners with Manuel, yeah? but we can have these two counter propagating edge sets. And now if I put an impurity, I cannot scatter between these two counter-propagating edge sets. This is exactly what it means topological invariant that I put scatterer between them, which let's say doesn't break time reversal symmetry, but it's, and it's not gonna mix these two edge states. So this can be shown, and that's what also Manuel a little bit discusses, that if I now put some perturbation V, which commutes with the time reversal symmetry, and these are two Kramer's partners related, so the spin up, spin down, they are related by the time reversal symmetry, then what happens is that I can use the properties. So I can write the psi as T phi, yeah? and then I can use the anti-unitarity of uh, time reversal operator. And remember that T squared is equal minus one for spin one half. And I immediately get is that the scattering through this impurity between these two states is equal to zero. And that's exactly what it means if I have an uh, odd number of Kramer's pairs. So odd number of the pairs of these edge states. Huh? And that's exactly what we discussed um, last week already. Okay, good. So, so as you can see, we have a formation, we call them helical edge states because spin and momentum follow each other. And uh, exactly, and that's exactly what is topological invariant. So what is topological invariant over there? We discuss it as a Z2. So the, the question is Z2 tells me if I have zero or one, yeah? So meaning if I have a, a positive uh, even number or odd number of the Kramer's partner pairs. And from the point of view of topology, what is important for us, as we discussed as well, was that the gap is not closing. Yeah? So if I have a, my brilliant zone and I'm looking at my band structure and I look at my gap, then I actually, the, as long as the gap is not closing, even if I am deforming my band structure, this, this is the same. And this is exactly as topology in the math so from the perspective of topology, I can without any problem take this football and actually change it to the bat in the American football. So from this perspective, the American football and the European football are the same from the perspective of the topology. Yeah? So that's exactly what, uh, um, what, what is related to the topological invariant, that we are very robust against any perturbations here. Okay. okay. So we talked about 2D topological insulators. In the 2D topological insulators, you have this one-dimensional edge states, which are metallic, yeah? But now for the 3D, 3D topological insulators, we have actually the surface states, which are metallic, yeah? So what happens is, and this is, for example, in bismuthium antimonase, there are also compounds which are showing it, bismuthium selenide, bismuthium telluride, many others now, 
where you can buy ARPES, so angular resolved photo emission, you can actually see the, and as an energy, you can see the dispersion, energy is a function of Kx, and you can see this kind of linear behavior of this two-dimensional system. So here sigma is spin, and P is momentum, and they are, sigma is in the x and y direction, and momentum is also x and y direction. So what happens is that, so this is the surface state of 3D topological insulator, this is two-dimensional, and interestingly enough, there is this, again, this spin momentum locking. So momentum, let's go, let it's going in this direction, and spin is going in this direction. On the opposite side, the momentum is flipping, but also spin is flipping, yeah? So you can see that momentum and spin is aligned. This is what I call spin momentum locking, that spin is actually locked with the direction of momentum. Interestingly enough, this causes that if I would, for example, put a potential and wanted to couple the states with P and minus P, and this potential doesn't flip the spin, yeah, so it's non-magnetic, then I have to get zero, because I can, to get this non-zero, I would need to actually flip the S to the minus S as well, yeah? So that's what is called also lack of backscattering, or scattering with the angle of 180 degree for this material. And now what we would like to do is, so we would like to combine this surface state of topological insulator. Is anybody okay with the surface states of topological, 3D topological insulator so far? So V is some Fermi velocity, sigma is sigma x. Okay, so let's just write this down more explicitly. So the Hamiltonian, which I am interested in, is just some Fermi velocity, V, yeah, and then I have sigma x px plus sigma y py, yeah? and obviously sigma x is Pauli matrix, px is uh, the momentum, yeah? and that's the, this is exactly this kind of two-dimensional structure where, or two-dimensional dispersion, where I have the spin momentum locking, and I wanted to understand what are the consequences of the spin momentum locking for the formation of the superconductivity in this material, okay? Let me explain what I mean by this. But before I do this, let me maybe remind you about superconductivity. And this looks more technical, so let's not get scared, especially. Okay, so here I put some complicated formula just to show I'm a theoretician, no, just joking. Okay, so you have full Hamiltonian H, which consists from H0 and H1, okay? So H0 is just a single party Hamiltonian. So remember that I can always write, yeah, I'm sure that you like much better this notation, but I decided to use the second quantization. So I can write, but you know very well that I can write it the, uh, the, in the second quantization, maybe let's just say one sentence about it is, instead of using a usual wave function, I'm actually using the occupation basis. So I ask how many states how many electrons is in a given state. So the psi dagger in the second quantization plays a role of the wave function. Okay, so uh, this first term then is just p square. Let's forget about this uh, vector potential for a moment being. So it's p square over 2m plus some potential. Yeah, so this is just a single particle. Now the second part is actually related to the four operators. So this is electron-electron interactions. Yeah, and I am actually creating two electrons and annihilating two electrons. Is this making sense? Good. So now I can use mean field, and I am sure that you hear that, that if I do mean field, what I do is that I actually average some of these operators. Yeah? So what I usually do is I, so the first term s survives, I don't need to do anything to this. So the second term, I can now divide it on different terms. Yeah? So I have this, as you see very well, is psi dagger r, Psi dagger, let's call it alpha, beta, psi alpha, psi beta. And I can do many different combinations related to this when I do averaging. Yeah? So let's say that I do averaging. And now, so I wanted to do mean field of this, of maybe better write like this, mean field. And then I get actually many different combinations. So I can get the combination which corresponds to the uh, Hartree, 
So this you know very well. So this is exactly this combination. Yeah, so I am, so the electron with symbol beta is in the average, or it's under influence of alcohol in the sense under influence of the density of the electron with alpha, yeah? So this is one term, so this would be Hartree. But I can also do something else. So I can actually do the things like this. And that's exactly what is related to the superconductivity. So I can ask what is the, uh, what is the elimination or destruction of the Cooper pair feeling when I form or when I am in the average, th average field of formation of other Cooper pairs. Yeah? And this is exactly what usually is called, let's I now say the same as I have here. So this is, um, so if obviously there is always Hermitian conjugate of this expression. If there would not be, then I would be in a very bad situation. Yeah? So this is what I call delta. So delta is exactly related to the average field of annihilation of the Cooper pairs of two electrons. And obviously this is what giving, is giving me this kind of terms, yeah? And then the Hermitian conjugate. And this is what I draw here is actually usual S-wave superconductivity. Why? Because I am actually having spin up and spin down, yeah? So I'm really forming a singlet. So that means is that the orbital part needs to be symmetric because the spin part is anti-symmetric, okay? So that's what I can actually see immediately. Is this making sense? Okay. Good. So now, let's do the following thing. I wanted actually to show you what happens. So that's exactly the system which we wanted to consider. We take a surface state of topological insulator and we put on this S-wave superconductor and we ask what kind of Hamiltonian, how does this Hamiltonian look like? Can we get a P-wave? And why does P-wave come out in this situation? Okay. So, let's do this. So for this, I think I need some notes. Yeah. So for is there is there simpler representation in your space of the surface state? What do you mean simpler? I mean, like if you put if you just consider edge space. Yeah. I can guess how it's going to look like. Yes. Okay, so it's gonna look like this. So that's what I say. It's gonna look like this, that you have a P and the S in the same direction, and this is oscillating around, yeah? I, I am very bad in drawing this, but I try. Yeah, so this is what happens. So this is my visualization. I don't know if you want something else. So you have just this kind of, you go around the, so this is energy, this is, let's say, P, and you are going around this kind of uh, Dirac surface, and every time the momentum is parallel to the spin. Is it making sense? So the point is, it's the same, okay, so for the, let's 2D Ti, 2D, and I wanted 1D edge state, yeah? It's not so different, it's just, it's, uh, you just have a Hamiltonian which is uh, P, X, Sigma, Z. We agree. And that's why you have these two edge states. And now in the uh, 2D surface of 3D, you just have two components. So I think I cannot help much better than writing something like this, which means that more or less you're just going around this cone. Okay. I mean, you can always do Fourier transform, but I don't think this is gonna look better. <laughs> yeah. Yes. 
Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, you are right. I skipped something. You are completely right. Look, but I put here minus signs. I'm already fine, you know. So how do I do this? So usually you need to have some, uh, to, to form a copper pair, you need some glue, as we say. So you need, for example, electron phonon pairing. Yeah? So what I did is already H1 has an effective interaction. So you usually, what you have is you have retarded electron phonon interaction and you have an electron-electron interaction, which is you have attractive and repulsive interaction. So at the end of the day, I just already assumed that this uh, uh, attractive interaction overcome the repulsive one. Make sense? Yeah, I mean, what I did is I put a minus sign here. So that means that this is actually attractive. I just effective, so I effectively, this electron phonon interaction constant is already inside of this expression. But that's a very good question. I could go further about it, but I will not do what I want to do if I do this, okay? So you can, we can discuss this more later as well. It's not obvious that this uh, electron phonon is uh, better than uh, electron, electron, and so on, but there, are, there is a way of showing things. So we can discuss later. Okay. So what I wanted to show is, I wanted to show the P wave superconductivity. in the surface state of 3DTI. So I have a full note, but I think if I do all of this, then it's going to take too much of my time. So I might have to do some shortcuts. Okay, so I'm talking about surface state, so we just wrote it. So let me write this down using this field operators or second quantization language, as we discussed. And I, instead of V, I use VF. Okay, I'm gonna change the symbols. That's the typical, yeah, for us. Well, as you can see, this is uh, more in a real space. I'm not sure if this is helping you, but that's, I mean, I just wrote a P as the a minus i dx dy, yeah? so yeah. Okay. So let's see. So once again, sigma x, sigma y are Pauli matrices. So I didn't yet put superconductivity here, and obviously psi. Maybe let's define it as well just that we have a definition, is just an um, field operator which is related to the annihilation operator in the second quantization. So it is related to the plane wave and the annihilation operator with some momentum k. Okay, and now what I wanted to do is something very simple which you guys can do in five minutes and I need more time. Yeah, so I wanted to diagonalize this matrix and find the eigenstates. So why am I doing it? Because what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rewrite the full Hamiltonian with the superconductivity in the basis of the Hamiltonian of the single particle surface state. And then you will see that I will not get a swayed superconductivity, I get something else. Okay, and that's exactly what I wanted to do. So, okay, so let's just suffer a little bit. Yeah? So this is simple. So I'm not gonna go through all steps. Okay, so what I am doing is, so this is spin basis, spin up, spin down, spin up, spin down. Yeah? So obviously, the everything happens, sigma z is not a good quantum number. I hope I don't have to convince you about it because it's, if I do commutation with the sigma z, it's not uh, working out, yeah? So, 
OK, so I can do this. And now I am sure that you can immediately see that I have two solutions. <coughs> An absolute value of um, uh, k. Actually, this is uh, k squared I should have. OK, OK, this is good. Mm -hmm. And Good, so what you can see immediately is that actually this expression, the plus and minus, has a little bit different. So this was my beautiful cone. I call it sometimes Dirac cone. But let's just put it here, k. Okay. And this is actually the plus and this is a minus. So let's put mu equal to 0 just for my own sake. Yeah, so you can see that the plus corresponds to the upper part of the cone, and the minus corresponds to the lower part of the cone. Okay? So that's the solutions which we got. And now we obviously can find the uh, wave functions. So let's do this. I'm going to just write it this down. And as your homework, you can check it. That this is... Maybe this theta k needs some explanation. So let's write this down somewhere. Because it's going to be important at the end of the day. It's obviously cosine theta k plus i sine theta k. And this is kx over k plus i k y over absolute value of k. And I'm going to need this definition later on. Good. So let's see. So let's remember then that plus and minus corresponds actually not to the spin, but to because spin is not a good quantum number of this uh, of this model actually corresponds to the conductional valence band or to the upper and lower part of the cone. Right? Is this making sense? Good. Now what I can do is I can combine these two solutions, plus and minus, to get still the spin solutions, to still get the uh, field operators, which are for spin up and spin down. And that's what I wanted to do. Yeah? So I wanted to have the right basis. Okay. So. I have to now remove some of these things, so let's leave this. So I can now combine the solutions, as we said. So my psi, the full psi operator, here has two components, <laughs> yeah, because spin up, spin down. Okay. And the psi up of R would be now I have to now take the upper solutions or the lower solutions. Yeah. So now I am taking I need to take both of the solutions to form the spin, yeah, because the plus and minus solutions are mixed. Yeah? So I will get this as the 1 over some regularization, which, as you will see at the end, this will cancel, so I don't care. Yeah? And this, yeah, so what I did is exactly I took the two components of the A plus and A minus. Yeah? This should give me exactly spin up yeah? from this basis. And for the spin down, I have to do the same. I just take lower components. So 
okay, and now in the lower component I have a plus minus, and this corresponds to the S plus minus, so I can, instead of writing plus minus, I just write S, e to the I theta K, C K S, so annihilation operate. Yeah. Exactly, plus minus, or so it's really telling me pseudo spin, the upper or lower part. Exactly, because the spin yeah. is not a good quantum number. That's why we cannot diagonalize it in a spin. That's exactly the point. Yeah. 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 So S is not a spin. S is here the upper or lower cone. Once again, I could call it differently. PS <laughs> pseudo spin. Okay, good. So I can now write this. Hamiltonian. My surface state Hamiltonian as follows. So H3D Ti surface, I can now write in this notation <laughs> again of this basis. S C dagger KS C KS. I am sure I forgot. Okay, and I have epsilon. Okay, epsilon S of K. Yeah. So this is now diagonal basis. Epsilon S of K is exactly this. That's exactly epsilon s. So these are two solutions. Yeah. And if I do like this, I can also write, instead of plus minus here, plus s. Okay? Good. So, so far, so good. Or only I have to remember that s is not a real spin, but it's a pseudo spin designating cone. Okay? Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite the um, superconducting Hamiltonian through the uh, basis of the surface states. Okay, so let's see how I'm going to do this. So let's write now superconducting Hamiltonian. We know how to write it now since we discussed it. So the superconducting Hamiltonian is S-wave. So we have these operators. They have to be destroying a Cooper pair, which is a singlet. Or, and I assume that delta is real for a moment being, which I can do this for the S-wave superconductor. And second part, which is um, forming a Cooper pair. Yeah. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite. So now these operators, which I had here, I'm going to substitute here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite the superconducting Hamiltonian in the basis of this uh, surface state. Yeah? So that's what I'm going to do. And I cannot show you all the steps because this will become a complicated uh, thing. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to now insert my star. Okay. So this is algebra. You can all do this into two stars. Okay. And the only thing which you need to know so maybe let me write the um, first expression of this. If I was 10 centimeter taller, this would help a lot. Okay. Good. So we just write then this H delta as um, delta And now I have to put the k, k prime, s, s prime. And then I have some of these normalization factors. E to the i, k plus k, 
prime r and then i have some s prime so you check it that this is right well i trust you guys plus if i make mistake here it's your fault uh, and s prime because you slept and you didn't correct me ah. k prime c dagger k prime s prime c dagger k prime s prime s actually sorry one has to be careful mm-hmm k where Uh, I think it's a prime because what I am, I have to give separate symbols for both of this. Uh, the K is possibly K. Yes, very good. You see? That's right. It should be K. One has to be K and second has to be K prime. That is question. Yes, I am talking about, that's exactly the point. So I have now, what I am doing is I am repeating a little bit with all details, full and Kane argument of getting a P-wave superconductivity. But that's not all stories. That's what I wanted to show you because this is now I'm talking about pseudospin. Superconductivity should be in real spin, as you know very well. So that's exactly where I'm going, yes. So now I have to write what is this expression. And I have to use the delta function. So you know that if I have this exponent of the EIK plus K prime multiplied by R and I make an integral over R, then I get a delta function of which is related to the fact that K has to be equal to the minus K prime. So I use this fact. And after some work, what I get, so this is your homework to actually get to the final expression. I need to start not remove. What I will get is, so this, this took me a, a page, yeah? But I think you can do this faster than me, so I trust you. So what I get is the following Hamiltonian. With now I'm writing a full one, the one which has the superconducting part and the one which is related to the surface state. And this is all in this basis of cone. Yeah? OK. So, so the S is again telling me the pseudo spin, the upper or lower part of the cone. And I get something like this. So this is first part, and the second part is kx minus i k y divided by k. Okay. Uh, this is absolute value. Yes. Good. So this is actually P-wave superconductivity in the pseudospin, by the way. But it has a problem with the situation of the real spin. Yeah. So now, as you can see, we have a first term, which is just an uh, um, surface state. But the second term, it's very unusual. Okay. So before, always we talked about, and now just let me draw some picture. That's we understand. So we always talk about S-wave superconductivity, SC, SC is superconductivity. So in this, as for S-wave superconductivity, I have actually the 
orbital part, which is symmetric, but then I am, it looks like S orbital, so meaning completely <coughs> spherical, but then I have a singlet. But for a P wave superconductivity, this is exactly what we got in this pseudospin. Is um, something looking like this. Yeah, and obviously should have the middle over here. Why? Because every time he is actually a k vector, but the k vector changes a sign depending if I am actually here or here. So if this is, let's say, kx, let's just make my life more easy, then you can see that I'm actually changing a sign going from the positive to the negative. So actually, the orbital part is asymmetric. Then the, for fermions, the spin part has to be symmetric. So this would be how it looks, uh, how it picture the P-wave superconductivity in this uh, S degree of freedom. Now, as already some of you complain, we have some problems. So it looks like, okay, so this actually looks more or less like a Kitaev model, which we discussed with Felix Opperman, von Oppen, sorry, von Oppen on uh, last week on Friday, yeah? But there is a problem here. This S is not a spin. So all Cooper pairs should be given in a spin, not in a pseudo spin. Okay? So there is two problems which we're going to resolve, or at least try to. Yeah? Two problems. So there are two degrees of freedom because there is S, which is plus and minus. So in general, I cannot have Majoranas because I remember I have to have a single degenerate state, so I should not have two spins. Huh? So this is not spinless. So now uh, not spinless, as we discussed. So there is no one degree of freedom. Then the second problem is, but this we can solve. So solution. Let's take a uh, mu much larger than zero and mu much larger than delta. Then I only take plus. Then I only have one degree of freedom, but I'm still in a pseudo spin. Yeah? But exactly what one of you already mentioned is that S is a pseudo spin. Not real spin. Well, so the argument is beautiful, looks like P wave, but it has something more. Yeah? So what is something more? So think about it now a little bit. Yeah? So what happens in this picture really? What happens in this picture is that I have singlets tunneling to the material when spin is not conserved. Yeah? So what we are having is we have, we to, to have a superconductivity, we have to have really well-defined spin, yeah, at least on one axis. What happens here, we don't. Yeah? So what happens is that we are having some singlets going here, but in this material, in the TI, the spin is not conserved. So I started with the singlet, but because spin is not conserved, I can flip to the P wave. So in general, what it means is, so it looks like a P wave in the pseudo spin. If we actually wrote this in the spin, it would be a mixture of a singlet and so it would be a mixture of S wave and P wave. So it would be actually mixed order parameter. Okay, so that's exactly what happens in the situation. One can see it, and I was thinking this is too much, but you can ask me, by the green function. So what one can do is write Bogolyu of the equation. I just come back in a moment, and then actually look at the correlation, green function, and then one can see that there is both singlet and triplet. So it's not true. And it's also not true for wires, only in some specific limits of the chemical potential and Zeeman energy where you have only P wave. In general, you always have a mixed S wave and P wave and you have to fight with this. And that's a, one of the problems which we have in all of these materials where you have a proximity induced superconductivity. Okay, so now what I could do is, so what so far we talked about is Cooper pairs. Oh, and there is question. Uh, well, it's, would, it's a very good question. And I think you would get some kind of uh, similar things. So what I remember is that uh, 
he at least the surface states is in the spin degree of freedom. In the graphene, actually, you are already at the level of the pseudo spin when you consider A and B lattice. So you have to do operation to get actually some, we actually tried this once. If you wanted to get some kind of uh, mixed order parameter, you need to involve all three degree of freedoms, valley, spin, and uh, A and B sub lattices. So it's much more complicated. So let's leave it for now. We can discuss this later as well. But now the point is, yeah, another question. Yes, uh, it's actually cancelling. I mean, I have in a note I can show you. I don't want to spend now time on it. It's really cancelling. You can show that it's cancelling. So this is all what is uh, non-zero. More uh, questions. So is it, is it significantly different if you get some Hartree-Fock approximation after doing uh, the Hartree-Fock approximation. So you're saying if I additionally had a Hartree-Fock term? No, I think what is, so the spin orbit coupling is a single part of Hamiltonian. It's only flipping a spin. So the spin orbit interaction cannot do much. It can only give you, remove a spin degeneracy, or even if the spin is not conserved, it can, s when you have two operators, then you remove electron with a spin up and form an electron with a spin down if spin is not conserved, for example. But you cannot really change anything here. So this is a single particle term. There's no problem with this. Okay. So now, instead of talking about Cooper pairs, what I prefer to talk to, and then as obviously it's much easier to, uh, to see this uh, Majoranas, well, I'm, let's try to connect this. Um, then I can actually talk about excitation. So instead of talking about so my sim the simplest picture, if you really don't want to do any math, is just to say I take a Cooper pair. And now, you know, I don't know. In a normal material, I don't know how to describe Cooper pair. So if I have a Josephson junction, uh, if I have a situation which we would like to consider where I have a superconductor and normal material, then I have a problem. I described superconductor, everything is beautiful, but I don't know what to do with the normal material. Yeah? So what do I do? Well, what the way I can do is actually to say in the normal material, I know that I can double the space. So additionally to the electrons, I can talk about holes. I can always do this. It's just like doubling of the space. What, what does it mean for a Cooper pair? That instead of talking about Cooper pair, I can, which is over here, I can talk about excitations. And the excitation language is actually related to having an electron and an excitation with second electron, let's say, I will treat which is moving in the opposite direction of the opposite spin as a hole. So I can, instead of talking about Cooper pairs, I can talk about electron hole excitations in a superconductor. And actually, one can show, so what we could do is, for example, for this Hamiltonian, since we already have it, I can very quickly convince you that this C, which we have here, is again not a right operator to diagonalize this Hamiltonian. Why? Because if I take this Hamiltonian, which let's call it H effective, and I actually commute it with C, I'm not going to get something which is proportional only to the C. Yeah, so this term gives me something proportional to the C, but this term actually gives me something which is proportional to the C dagger. So that means is, that these terms actually, that this is, this is not proportional just to something, C. So that means that these bases do not diagonalize this Hamiltonian. Which bases then diagonalize this Hamiltonian? Well, the bases which can include Majoranas. Okay, just to give you the hint. Okay, so again, I am, uh, I am a little bit here, uh, roughly speaking, okay, so don't kill me immediately, just slowly, okay. Um. So what I can actually, how can I can diagonalize this Hamiltonian? 
by putting excitations, by putting excitation, which is a combination of electron and holes. Look, I like to use gamma because we know that gamma was before in the previous talk described as Majorana. Yeah, so obviously if I have a wave superconductivity, I cannot solve it. But if I would have P wave superconductivity as I have here, I can find a condition between U1 and Vn star to actually have a situation that gamma n is equal gamma n star or conjugate, gamma n conjugate. So this is exactly the condition that particle is equal to the antiparticle. So I am rewriting my operator psi as now, which was related to the Cooper pairs before, yeah, or which was two of these psi were related to the Cooper pairs as an excitation of so electrons and holes. And if these amplitudes of this uh, excitations are the same, then I could get a Majorana. And this is exactly happening for zero energy. So this is excitation picture already. When I actually now consider instead of Cooper pairs, electron and hole excitations, and if I actually find a zero solution, then I said, okay, I found a Majorana. Okay, so that would happen. Additionally to this, I wanted to remind you here the Andreev, um, uh, Andreev reflection. So if I have some incident electrons, that's what Yuli was talking about. Yeah? And I have a Cooper pair here. Then the only way is that I can actually write it down and have a conservation of the charge and energy is by reflection of the hole. Yeah? Because we would like to have the same amount of the charge on the left side as on the right side, just that we should not produce more charge in the system. Okay? Good. So the U and V N, these are some coefficients. Before the, these are the operators, which are having fermionic properties, and these are some coefficients. If they would be actually the same, then I could actually re exactly rewrite my fermion through the two Majoranas. This doesn't happen for the S wave superconductor, but could happen uh, for the P wave, and that's why we know that exactly the level, which is equally shared between electron and holes is related to the Majorana fermion. Yeah, so one can immediately see from this excitation picture that it can be a situation where one can construct a Majorana. So that's only what I wanted to show. I, I cannot show now the exact derivation in the time scale which I'm having. Yeah, and you remember as well, that's what I need uh, additionally. So what uh, Felix was showing uh, last time, that I can write my fermion through two Majoranas. So let's say if my C is uh, gamma plus I gamma over two, then my C dagger would be gamma minus I gamma over two. Yeah? So I will need this in a moment. So two Majoranas, they can be local on, or non-local. We would prefer in the wires to them to be non-local. Uh, they are fer forming a one electron operator. And that's why some of the 2E is changing into E in the equations. That's you will see in a moment what I mean. Okay, so that's what, what we went. Okay. okay, so now I'm writing exactly in this Bogolyub of the Gen equation. Don't worry, this is almost the last equation which I have. Almost, yeah. So now I'm writing in this, in this space of this Psi dagger operators, my a real spin, he actually I'm using clear a real spin. So I am writing the surface state. So this is for electrons, fuzzy particles, this is for holes. Then obviously chemical potential is differently calculated for electrons and holes, that's why this minus sign. And this actually gives me the singlet. And you can actually convince yourself it's a singlet because it has to be of diagonal. But that's not so important, so don't worry about this. Even if it's Hamiltonian makes not yet completely sense. What we wanted to go is after physics. With this is what's important, yeah? So what we discussed five minutes ago, that because this singlet tunnels to the TI, and in the TI I don't conserve the spin, so broken spin rotational symmetry causes the mixed order parameter, which is S wave and P wave. Yeah, and you can read up a little bit more in these papers if you want. Okay. So. So are we now hopeless? That's a question uh, always number one. Are we hopeless or not? So 
we, I, everybody tells you it's such a beautiful platform to find Majoranas, you have P-Wave and so on and so on. But you see that it's really a mixture of, uh, uh, of the two different order parameters. So now obviously we need to think how to eliminate this, yeah? how to eliminate S-Wave component or how to make this P-Wave component which is related to Majorana visible. And that's what is the rest of this lecture about, yeah? to try to make it more visible. So that's what you also discussed with uh, Yuli a little bit. So this is like, a, so if you look at this junction, it's not really difficult to solve. So what you are doing is, so usually you solve some kind of uh, Schrodinger equation with the boundary conditions. So now what you are doing is when you solve this Josephson effect, but with the superconductor, when you have this doubling of the space, you have this Bogolyubov de Jean equation, but then what you do is you just match the wave function at the interface. So from the perspective of the quantum mechanics, it's just the same kind of quantum well problem. So I think about this fellow here as a quantum well, and that's why I can have a bound state here. Why? Because obviously I have some gap in the superconductor. So then for this electron, which is here in the Andreev bound states, it has to more or less behave like an electron in the quantum well. So that's if it's making now many of its scatterings, so that's what we discussed. So this Andreev reflection, yeah? So I am coming here as an electron, but obviously because he in the superconductor I only can form a Cooper pair when I have to reflect as a whole. If I do this process many times, <coughs> then I form a bound state. And that's exactly what is called Andreev bound state, okay? Good. So now I would like to, to this bound state to be different in topological material than in the normal material. I mean, if I take aluminum, and I would like to have this bound state very different than if I take a S-wave superconductor on the topological insulator. That's more or less what I want. And indeed, one can see this if one puts a barrier. So remember, in the relativistic physics, you talk about Klein tunneling. It's always tunneling of an electron, a relativistic electron with a transmission of one. Now what happens is, and this exactly comes from this kind of spin momentum locking of this uh, uh, first mode related to the Cooper pair is that actually you have a transmission of uh, this Cooper pair with the transmission one. So let's say that I take only uh, first mode. So I have sigma x px. Yeah? And now I'm going to the barrier. Okay. Now I would like to reflect what happens is I need to change p to the minus p. Yeah, so this is in the correlation function or in, in my, of the condensate. And, uh, but I have to also change S to the minus S. But I have a time reversal symmetry in a system. So I didn't yet put any fluxes. So this is not allowed. This is the same as remember what I wrote before, that if I have V minus P state for the surface state, P is zero. Because if I would like to, if this V is not switching spin because this state is minus s and this state is s. Okay, sigma now. This is sigma is spin. Yeah. Then actually I cannot do this. So the same is here. So what happens is that you have a very specific first mode. So if you only consider the lowest mode, if you have more modes, then you can go around the Fermi surface and actually backscatter. So for the first mode, term, trans transmission is always one. So we call it superconducting with Grigory, superconducting Klein tunneling, meaning that the Cooper pairs tunnel with uh, the probability of one because they cannot reflect because of this kind of uh, spin momentum locking. Okay. Independently, how large is the barrier in a junction? Okay. So then the question is, okay, so, yes. Exactly. Exactly. Because for, for zero mode, there is only two states. And uh, if you have now, I, I see you. If you have many modes, then obviously you can go around the surface state and somehow backscatter. Yeah? So for only for the lowest mode, you have this protection. Question? Is that independent of the barrier exists? Or barrier strength. So if I put it very large, so I have a picture in a moment. 
it's gonna still survive. I mean, here we put a delta barrier, but that's, I think this is very general statement. Because this, because in the, you, you have no place to backscatter, as we just say, yeah? So if you don't have a place to backscatter, then independently how large is your barrier, you cannot do much to the system. Now comes the second thing which you need to know, which is, so this mode is four pi periodic. Do we know why? No, or yes. Okay, so this comes the second thing which I have to explain you. So let's try to do this quickly and painless, quick and painless. Okay, well, let's say that I have, and this I actually stole from Carlo Benacker, so I have to say this immediately. Okay, so let's say that I put in the ring the flux, magnetic flux, yeah? And then I do have here a superconductor, and this is my barrier. Because I like this explanation very, it looks very easy. I'm not sure this helps, but it looks very easy at least, yeah? And let's say that I have a phase difference phi between this part of the superconductor and this part of the superconductor, yeah? So this is Josephson junction where I have magnetic flux, change a phase, yeah? Good. So I can, instead of talking about the flux, I can actually rewrite it through the phase difference between superconductors and the flux quanta of superconductor. And flux quanta of superconductor is h over 2e. Yeah? So if I now acquire a phase of 2 pi, then I exactly put the flux, which is phi over it's actually phi is equal to the h over 2e. And why is there is 2e here? Because we are talking about the Cooper pair, okay? So if I now draw, this is actually helping me very quickly to draw energy dispersion of this kind of state as a function of the phase. And here is my superconducting delta. So this is my gap, superconducting gap. And now I have, say, one fellow and second fellow. So how does this change? Well, I am actually exactly 2 pi is my period here for the phase. Yeah? So, so this should be obviously on the order of this. Good. So this is normal JJ, I call it, Josephson junction. <coughs> okay? But this is very different if I have a topological Josephson junction. Why? Because I draw something and then I uh, get rid of this. Because every fermion, that's at least this analogy I like, is consisting from two Majoranas. So if I form the Cooper pairs from Majoranas, then actually I will not have a charge of 2E. I will have from the two Majoranas a charge of one fermion. So I will have a charge of E. Okay, so what happens is that instead of this condition for topological JJ, I will have that the flux which I put inside is actually related to the flux of the Cooper pair, but now Cooper pair has a charge E. So the periodicity of my energy as a function of the phase or supercurrent as a function of the phase will change. So I will now have for pi periodicity. So that's exactly so. This is, now I should be careful here. This is 2 pi. Yeah. And here, this is 2 pi. Yeah. So I go only half of the period, here is pi, yeah, before I actually reach the point to pi. Yeah. So that means that the periodicity of this junction is not 2 pi, it's actually 4 pi. Yeah, so that's how I can distinguish between the topological junction and the normal junction because the periodicity is different. And indeed, for this mode, which I said it's topological, I am getting the 4 pi periodicity here. So that's how I know that this is actually topological because 
instead of having here 2e, which is usual Cooper pair, now I form from two Majorana's Cooper pair, and I have here e. Is this making sense, guys? Okay. I lost everybody, hopefully not yet. Good. So you see that for the topological junction, I indeed have a zero energy state around pi. Pi is different pi. And this zero energy state should be related to my Orana. Okay, so this is why, okay, so there is still, there is always some subtle, subtle points here. But in general, this is more or less what we are trying to find here, okay? So you can see that this first mode, I said that it has this superconducting Klein tunneling, it was not reflecting, it is going through, and it has indeed for pi periodicity. All other modes are trivial, and they are related actually to all of these parts of the S-wave superconductivity as well, which is in the system. Yeah? Okay, so here is the problem. Now I have to still distinguish this four pi periodic mode from the all other modes. How do I do this? And how do I distinguish now between these crossings, because you should ask me, how do you distinguish between these crossings and this particular crossing? Yeah? So this crossing is protected by the time reversal symmetry in this situation, as well as by helicity, but let's leave it. But it's actually protected crossing. While these crossings, when I actually put a barrier or do something to the system, they actually annihilate each other. And this is what you can see also in this kind of difference between this uh, energy dispersion or energy phase dispersion for this uh, superconductor TI superconductor junction and superconductor normal superconductor junction. So what you can see in this situation is that independently on the barrier, you just get these two solutions. Yeah? So plus minus delta cosine phi two. Now you remember, that's what Yuli told you as well, is that the supercurrent, which I call IC or I, let's call it, is dE over d phi, which makes sense because then in a, what would we expect for a usual Josephson junction? That the supercurrent is proportional to the sine of phi. Yeah? What would we expect here? That the supercurrent is proportional to the sine of phi over two. Yeah? Because what I do is I just make a derivative in respect to the phase. Yeah, and then I just get from the cosine. Yeah, so plus minus cosine phi over two gives me plus minus sine phi over two. Yeah, and here plus minus sine phi. Yeah? So that's exactly this periodicity which we want to see. Now what happens in this junction is because of this single mode which we said is not backscattering is that the supercurrent actually in this STIS junction is going to the finite value. This is very different for a S and S junction, because D is actually a transparency. So the more tunneling this junction is, this actually goes, uh, that's I do not say, to zero. D goes to zero. Yeah? And then actually the Andreev bound states, this is, these two crossings annihilate, and Andreev bound states move to the border of the gap. And that's exactly what's how we would behave if the Andreev bound states under the, uh, under the barrier if we would have aluminum, so some trivial Josephson junction. Okay? So we still would have some Andreev bound states, but they would be differently behaving under the barrier, for example. Okay, question. No. That's for sure not. Because then, like, uh, I still ask the question to many of the girls, um, like, if you decouple your mm -hmm. two Majoranas, mm -hmm. then you have the two MS for uh, TI. But I don't know. It's also in two MK. In a so what is the question once again? No, no, I, I think there is a square root of D also in the... There is no square root of D, because this would mean, okay, so why I am sure at least not for this uh, four pi mode. That is for sure not. And I am kind of sure about it that this mode is exactly the one which is surviving here. If it was there, then it would behave exactly the same as, as a normal and you could not distinguish. Yeah. So I'm kind of sure that because of this uh, superconducting Klein tunneling is behaving differently. Uh, 
Okay, uh, so once again, what was the argument here? Is that I have a ring, superconducting ring with a barrier. So it's Josephson junction. I just make it on the ring. Then I put a flux. So now the question is how much of a phase of the Josephson junction changes to get a one flux. One flux for the Cooper pair, you know, it is phi zero. Phi zero usually is H over E for single electron. But here we have two electrons. So you see that. I have to go with the phase over 2 pi to get this flux of h over 2e, okay? Well, what does it mean is, okay, so I can now draw the energy of this Josephson junction as a function of a phase. And that's what I did. So what I, well, the only thing which I wanted to show here, the periodicity, the difference in the periodicity. So if my Cooper pair consists from two electrons, then the periodicity is different than if my Cooper pair, uh, pair consists of two Majoranas because two Majoranas form only one fermion. So instead of having two E, I get E. So this is an energy as a function of phase. Is this explaining? <laughs> oh, question? Okay. I think the only thing I would say is, and it's not always, but in this situation it is, is for example, periodicity of the current phase, supercurrent phase relation can tell you. Yeah, so what I, how I think about it, and this is very, what I'm saying now is very rough, because obviously I don't have, uh, uh, f I mean, I don't think we have time till uh, 9 p.m., yeah, guys? So what I'm trying to say is, is that, I, I think about it, and it's not always you can think about it, because you remember that n last time, what said also Felix, is that the gamma alone is neutral, yeah? But two gammas form the uh, uh, electron, yeah? So from this perspective, if I form electron from two Majoranas, then it's actually the charge is changing. So the only thing which I can see is, is the change of this charge, which is between two E Cooper pair to the E Cooper pair. That's the way I would say. That's what I'm worrying about. You might, you might get the superconductivity from any normal electron if you have a Cooper pair of iron atomic. I understand where you are saying, where you are going. You're trying to tell me that the flux of uh, something which is trivial would also have E charge. Well, but that's exactly what's the part of the problems why this um, a Majorana is called often marijuana, yeah? And why this is so <laughs> difficult. That's why it is so difficult to find her or find him, yeah? You know that actually Majorana got lost, yeah, on the, on the trip. Okay, but I, what I'm trying to say, sailing trip, but what I am, not in, the, not in the mountains, but what I'm trying to say here is uh, exactly this, is that obviously, I mean, I am not expecting here something which is uh, trivial coming just from the mesoscopic physics because I have a superconductor. So if I see the supercurrent, which is for pi periodic, I expect that something weird really happened with the pairing. So that's the only thing which, uh, uh, which I can say, yeah? So that's, but that's exactly, this is one of the reasons is that people, for example, see some peaks, but the question always is about the factor of two, and you never know if what is the factor of two coming from. And that's what makes the detection of Majorana so difficult. It's another reason, actually. Okay. There was more questions. Uh, in under which, which, in which case, because... Uh, Yes, so what, remember what I wrote there is that I then decided to be only in the plus band. So the mu is much larger than delta. So I decided to emit all lower cone. Then I only have a one degree of freedom, yes. There is no way that if I have two degree of freedom, then again I am getting into some pseudo spin or but spin, pseudo spin full liquid. And again, uh, I, I have the same problem as we discussed uh, on Friday, yeah? Very good.
OK, so that's one thing which I can do. But I can do also something else. And that's what we are working on currently. So uh, with uh, some experimentalists. So instead of looking at the supercurrent, we could actually try to look at the phase-dependent thermal conductance. And now you should start shouting on me, really. Okay? Because you should know that the transport through the superconducting gap is dissipationless. Or? So how can I have a thermal transport through the superconducting gap? Obviously, I cannot. Yeah? So if I have a finite temperature, then, and that's actually was uh, shown long time ago, is that what happens is, is that I can thermally excite a Cooper pair and break it. So I still have, can have a transport, even if I have a finite temperature. And I know about the phase of the Cooper pair because I broken, I, I, I break it in a finite temperature. And because I have transport of the quasi particles above the gap. So I still can do, actually, the thermal transport through the superconducting junction. But obviously not through the gap, once again. So the thermal conductance can be also phase dependent. And it is actually, as you will see in a moment. So what I am doing is, is now what I am thinking is the usual transmission. But now I have to integrate over all states, which are above the gap from the delta to the infinity. And I have some energy integrant, yeah, which actually tells me which states I take into account. And um, interestingly enough, is so what I am doing is I wanted to see this uh, um, Majorana or this four pi mode in a gap from the perspective of looking outside of the gap. Yeah, so that's what I'm trying to do now. Okay, so this is actually kind of a quite interesting approach, uh, which we are trying to develop now with some experimentalists from Pisa, Francesco Giazotto, for example. So what happens is that if I have, so what I'm drawing here, let me just first explain. So what I'm drawing here is some energy scale, omega, divided by the superconducting gap as a function of the phase. And I am doing this on the left side for the superconducting Ti, superconducting junction, and on the right side for the superconducting normal superconducting junction. And now I am again putting in the middle of this junction a barrier. Yeah? So again, I am trying to eliminate the modes. So for the situation of the topological junction, this mode stays because this crossing is protected. That's why I cannot remove it. You see? So that's another reason why you cannot remove this a crossing by the barrier. So it's surviving here. However, the full density of states, so what I'm drawing here with the color is full density of states. Full density of states of a small system is normalized. That means that if I have a state here, then I have to remove some of the density of states here. So I will always get a minimum. So if I look at the thermal, phase-dependent thermal conductivity as a function of phase, independently how large is the barrier, because this state survives. This is my exactly my Andreev bound state, topological Andreev bound state, or my Rana, we said. Then this fellow has minimum. But for a normal junction, what happens is, is that the, with the barrier, we actually, with the transparency of the barrier, so if I make the barrier stronger and stronger, what happens is that this state is moving to the gap, to the edge of the gap. And then, because it's moving here, then again I do renormalization of the density of states, and I actually get here maximum. So instead of in the phase-dependent thermal conductivity as a function of phase, I would actually get a maximum if I would have a tunnel junction, so if I had a very low transparency, while in the STIS, I would have actually the minimum. So one could actually measure it and hopefully see it. And this effect is not only for a single mode, as we were discussing before, but even if you have many modes, this survives and actually show this. Yes? Yeah. So this one was the one that you really had the That's too bad. <laughs> Yes. Exactly there. Exactly in the gap. Area. Exactly. So this is why you still see a dip, and then at some point it doesn't get transmitted anymore, and it starts to make the. Okay. Exactly because this uh, 
in the, this kind of usual ballistic junctions on aluminium, you have obviously some kind of spurious and rare pancits which we draw here. And now the point is if this places here, if these crossings are protected or no, if they are not protected, then what happens is that with the barrier, the state goes, these two points annihilate, and the state goes to the delta, yeah? And for the topological state, this never happens. And that's why this survives, and that's why it's giving a very different signature. Exactly. Good. So actually, we, as I said, one could try to measure this by using some kind of squid device. So here, applying into, so this is again, so squid, remember, there are two, this means two of Sasson junctions. Yeah, and this is again based on the TIs. And the idea is that you obviously change the temperature. Yeah, so you have a left and right, and the temperature of left and right is different. And obviously, if you calculate this kind of squid, you need to take into account the phonon bath. And then what you wanted to know is the heat or phase dependent conductance which is transmitted between left and right. You can change here by magnetic field the phase again. Yeah, and what you find is that this change of the heat is related exactly to this thermal conductance, which we calculated, and difference of the temperature between left and right. And if you actually take the left lead with 500 millikelvin and some buff temperature of 100 millikelvin, then you get a change of the temperature in the right lead around 20, 30 millikelvin. They can measure 100 microkelvin in PISA. So this is very, this is much larger signal than you can measure on the usual aluminum devices. So we are hoping that this can be done. So this is kind of experiment where you could actually hopefully see this kind of minimum instead of maximum in the phase conductance, which is translated here to the uh, oscillation of the temperature. Okay. Uh, you will need, uh, okay, so what you need, usually TI never does transparent barriers. So the proximity induced uh, superconductivity usually is never transparent, but you would need some gate, for example, or non transparent barrier. Yes. Okay, so now I guess I don't have time for the last part but it's also quite interesting. But some of you ask me what is rush by a 2 dex. So I'm not sure if I can whatsoever start with this. Who doesn't know who, what is rush by 2 dex? Wow, okay. Good. So that's what I thought. So that's gonna happen. Okay, so now that's another proposal. So you heard about these wires. Well, when you actually had also Rajba spin orbit interactions. So Rajba Tudek is really Rajba spin orbit interaction, okay? So instead of having a system, so so far we had a surface state, which was more or less linear, and this was an edge as a function of k. Now imagine that I add to this quadratic terms. So I had, before I had a, uh, let's say Hamiltonian like this, and now I add to this quadratic terms. So what happens is, this happens, what happens is that this lower part will go up. So this is this part. And now this transforms after this p square over 2m to the situation like this. I try to draw it. So what, I, what happens is that I now I have a parabolic because the p square over 2m is a main term. So this is usual parabolic dispersion. And to this I am adding a spin orbit interaction. That's why I call it 2 deck with Rajba because it has two-dimensional spin orbit interaction. And then what I do is actually I split the degeneracy. So this is what I am doing is more or less I am putting this other part of the, or cutting, making a cutoff of this linear dispersion, so this will just start to look like this. Again, what happens is, as you can notice, is the same term as we had before. So I should again expect mix S and P wave coupling in the superconductivity because I again have this kind of um, uh, sigma X, sigma Y in the situations, okay? 
So that's, this is exactly Rajba. I mean, sometimes it's P cross sigma, okay? But uh, uh, forgive me that I call this Rajba because by unitary transformation, you can usually go from Dresselhaus to Rajba. Let's say something like this and to not make it too complicated. Okay, so now if I, can I have still five minutes? I have to ask chair. <laughs> so I just only wanted to tell you, I mean, this will not be understandable anyway in such a short period of time, but I just wanted to tell you ideas. So now what we do is we replace this uh, three-dimensional TI or, or the surface states of three-dimensional TI by the Rajba spin orbit interaction. And then we are actually looking at the Josephson effect on this kind of structure. And because now we have two bands, I hope that you both agree with me, if I have a chemical potential, I have two bands, I have to still apply magnetic field to get the spinless particles to think even about my Orana. So that's why I need to additionally apply magnetic field here. Okay. Well, and um, it comes out that this kind of setup of this Josephson junctions could be an alternative to the wires, which you saw on Friday. So this was the wires, and you see some peaks. So I don't want to discuss this now more. What's interesting here is that because of this double degeneracy, as we said, if I, if I start without magnetic field, then in general, this point is not protected because I have a double degenerate state. But if I now introduce magnetic field, in a system. What I do is I actually split this point into two and I can have a top as if energy as a function of phase, I can have a large topological regime. I can actually calculate from the scattering matrix or just from some up scattering approach, where is my phase diagram and so on. You can ask me later how I did it. But the point is because I promised chair some experimental setup. So this is actually experimental structure, okay? So this is now mercury terrorite quantum well. I told you when the chemical potential was exactly in the gap and you were looking at the edge states and it was topological, it was beautiful. But you can always put your chemical potential far away and then you have a strong spin orbit interaction and that's what I need, yeah? So you can dope this mercury terrorite quantum wells. You have strong spin orbit interaction, and you can still do this kind of experiment here, okay? So you have here out of plane magnetic field to modulate the phase. So let's say this is mercury terrorite quantum well. Now this fellow here, all of this still blue, is the aluminum. So this is aluminum. Here there is a flux. Here there is magnetic field in the x direction. And what they actually look is they put a voltage difference between this superconducting lead or this superconducting lead is connected and the probe, which is some kind of tunnel probe. And then they can actually uh, measure the differential conductance. And interesting thing about this setup is that the topological regime doesn't only appear for the phase equal pi, as I draw here, that there was zero energy states around the phase equal pi, but you can have the phase diagram which is huge one which doesn't only have a uh, topological phase or topological states around pi but actually in a huge regime here okay what they measure is something which you don't know exactly what it is before you do not do numerical simulation and try to understand this a little bit so what happens is that they look at the here is a phase difference here is a bias so this is what gives me the differential conductance here is in plane magnetic field if I do not have this in plane magnetic field, so let's go back, then I have this double degenerate point and I don't have a topological phase. When I have this magnetic field, something happens in plane magnetic field. So the BZ is changing once again the flux, the phase in my system, and the BX, I am actually increasing BX, and I can go from the situation where I have a minimum in the differential conductance as a function of bias to the maximum in the differential conductance. So we actually believe that this 
going, so we did lots of simulations, this going from this minimum to the maximum is exactly corresponding to go, to go through this um, regime between trivial and topological. So here actually we are in the trivial states, we see minimum, and then we go through this structure of the diamonds, which gives me a peak in the differential conductance. So we actually should see the Majoranas. Majoranas here, however, are very difficult to see. And you can ask me why, okay? But so numerical simulations exactly ho shows that the formation of a peak in this differential conductance, as you can see, the, it's amazingly good. We used quant here, indicates topological transition. So indeed, one could actually say, okay, I have some topological transition, where are the Majoranas? And that's a question which I expect from you to ask me. Now I acknowledge my collaborators, all great collaborators and my group once again, and thank you very much for your attention. Okay, just ask me later. <laughs> I'm here.